pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation, Ian. So let's dive in, and I hope everybody had a wonderful lunch. Okay, so by way of introduction, my name is Artem. I run Karakan Capital, which is an investment firm based in the Bay Area. Started about seven years ago. I do not exclusively invest in microcaps. I have some large investments as well, but I do love investing in microcaps. And for those who are chess fans, Karakan obviously stands for a chess opening. For those of you who are not chess fans, obviously that's time to become ones, or at the very least, you can know where the name comes from. Uh, disclaimer, this is not a solicitation or offer to buy or sell securities, and content below is for educational purposes only. So in terms of the strategy, the easiest way and the shortest way to describe it is I want to be hunting for multi-baggers. And then there are three questions. Why multi-baggers? Simply because I want to maximize return on time. It almost always takes as much time to analyze an opportunity with two, three, five hundred percent upside potential as analyzing an opportunity that has 30 or 50 percent upside. So in that case, why bother? Focus on the big game. Second question, why primarily micro cap and small cap? So when I was growing up outside of the US, I heard this quote from one of the American movies. When someone was asked why that person robs banks, he said, because this is where money is. So same with microcaps. In general, it's less efficient market. That's why I like spending time there. Little self start coverage, etc. And then the third question is, what's the research process for that? And this is where I work very hard to structure all elements to get to those multi-bag opportunities. It doesn't always succeed, but this is my attempt. So that's the research process. Seem obviously oversimplified and overgeneralized in just six steps. So first, where do ideas come from? Honestly, from many, many, many places. Microcap Leadership Summit will be one of them. The most fruitful route for me, based on my experience, is simply meet with companies and with company and company day after day. And when you meet a few hundreds of them a year, at least some of them will be attractive. To be clear, most of those meetings end up being a waste of time, but few wouldn't, and some of them could generate very strong returns. And uh, what I found in my experience is that very often the key ingredient to success is actually know that this microcap, this particular business, this particular opportunity exists and find it out before the broad market does. The research process itself, again, some oversimplistically includes six steps. First, what is customer value proposition? That's the key. Eventually, it's the customer who will determine the fate of the business. Second, what's the product service, penetration, and potential market? What's the 10? Third, what's a, what is competition today? And this is very important, how it would develop in the future. You never know, but you can develop different scenarios. Number four, what are the unit economics of the product or service? In other words, how much money does the company make on every single transaction or every single customer interaction? Fifth, what would financials look like three to five years out? And finally, what's the valuation is three or five years out? With that, let me share with you another exciting thing, which is my second disclaimer. I will be talking today about the stock of a company called GAN, G-A-N. This is not an investment recommendation to buy or sell GAN shares or related securities. This is an educational presentation, and Artem Falken and all Karakan Capital LLC and all related entities have economic loan position in GAN shares and all related securities. Okay, with that excitement behind us, now we're going into elevator pitch. So why I'm interested in GAN? So first, it's a business-to-business, -business, B2B, SaaS player in an industry that is structurally attractive and also experiencing secular drops. By getting exposure to GAN, you also get exposed to secular trends of iGaming and ongoing legalization. GAN enjoys sticky customer base and high switching costs, structurally high margin profile, limited competition, beaten down stock today, founder CEO owns about 6%. Now, before we go any further, let me talk about my own biases so that you know the context. This is my actually the second time being a GAN shareholder. I first bought GAN shares when it was a Northern stock listed the name in London. It was good days of second half 2016, first half 2017, and I paid less than $2 adjusting for splits. And it became a multi bagger for me in 2020, 2021, so I really enjoyed the outcome and the process, research process along the way. I sold the shares subsequently, and I was quite sad to let the shares go. I miss being a GAN shareholder. 
And now, in my opinion, today, Mr. Market presents another attractive opportunity. Hence, I reestablished my position. However, maybe I'm just falling a victim of my own cognitive biases, trying to relieve my glorious prior days from the past. Time will tell. Now, when you look at this graph, I think it has stunning beauty. First, the stock went up more than uh, more than a thousand percent, and now it goes down by more than ninety percent. Like that's a beautiful chart. As you know, when you invest in microcaps, sometimes you invest in microcaps that you grow microcap, and now you're hoping it will become small cap or mid cap or something. Sometimes you invest in something that used to be huge, and now it's a microcap. Those I generally do not like. And here we have a situation where something used to be a microcap, stopped being a microcap, and now it's back again. I agree, chart of the day. Okay, so how did it happen? How this stock goes first like this, and then it goes like that? Okay, so first, enthusiasm about iGaming in general has been fading. You can take a look at the stock price of DraftKings, for example, as a proxy for the space. You will see. Second, iGaming legalization wave has slowed down substantially. Then growth has slowed down as well. Market participants extrapolated GAN's profitability from late 2019 into the future. And when that extrapolation turned out to be not the case, in other words, those market participants were incorrect, understandably, they ended up being quite disappointed. GAN also has added a B2C business, which is outside of the US which made B2B revenue only one third of total revenue. So most likely a reasonable investor will conduct some of the parts valuation analysis, which is, a, which is not rocket science, but it does make things more complicated. Capital structure at a glance so that you know the context, roughly 121 million market cap. There is, uh, there is some debt and debt equivalents, call it 28 cash and cash equivalents. So enterprise value of roughly 99 million. So through micro cap again, now, this is business at a glance. If you see too many boxes, don't worry, I'll walk through them very quickly. So GAN has two businesses, B2C and B2B. B2C is an interesting business. It's side of the US. It generates, it's profitable. However, I'm not going to focus on that one. I am more partially because I'm really excited about B2B opportunity. Second of all, Ian gave me only 20 minutes. Same for everybody. So that's why I need to skip something. That something will be B2C. And within B2B, they have PAM, which stands for Platform Account Management. Think about this way. If you're going to spend money playing one of the, playing either iGaming or sports betting via an app on your phone, then something must be behind it to do everything behind. Call it back office of that business. Simplistically, it can be payment processing. It can be keeping track of your bets, whatever. So that called PAM. Then there's Sport Betting Engine that keeps managing stay, uh, bets. And then there's RGS, which is a remote gaming server. Think about the content. And PAM can be for iGaming and can be for online sports betting. Some of the selected B2B clients of GAN, Win Resorts, technically it's Win Interactive, which is a digital arm of Win. For example, uh, they, work, uh, get, they work with GAN. Uh, FanDuel is another notable client. Now, if you look at revenue model, how does GAN make money? So it's a, in my opinion, it's a beautiful revenue model. It's based on take rate. Normally, GAN takes certain percent of whatever revenue. It can be net revenue, can be GGR, which is gross revenue, obviously depends on the contract. I believe net is more common. Whatever the customer makes, GAN will take a percent. So it aligns GAN well with the success of their customers. It's also because it's effectively usage-based, it also makes net revenue expansion a little bit easier, in my opinion. Because if you go, like, one way you can expand your revenue, you need to increase prices. That's tough to do. On the other hand, if your customer simply makes more money, and now that customer writes a bigger share, it's a little bit easier. Geographic footprint, as I said. Again, B2B business is mostly in the United States, mostly. B2C business is mostly outside of the U.S. And this is important, and there is this misconception, I believe, in the market, that GAN, some people say, like, oh, GAN is competing with its customers. I, it's almost never the case. There is one or two exceptions. 
but it's almost never the case. So we don't have this conflict of interest here. So product offering, then can provide one-stop shopping or a la carte offering. Remember those few boxes which I showed? You can pick up all of them or one of them. Time for gaming, time for online sports betting, Game Sports, which is again mentioned that sports engine. Uh, it used to be formally co called CoolBet, and Gen acquired that and renamed it as Gen Sports. And then there is Super RGS. Why having multiple products is important? A couple of reasons. So, first, it allows you to increase and maximize the wallet share. In other words, if customers, if your customers can, are going to spend $10 out of every, I'm making these numbers up a little bit, out of every $100 they make, don't let them spend money with other vendors. Try to capture as much as you can. And then it also allows you better leverage sales and marketing costs. Plus, some clients come to iGaming, online sports betting, by choosing PAN first, and then they pick up sports betting engine. Some people do it in reverse order. So having multiple products allows GAN to meet their customers or potential customers wherever they are in their customer journey. Customer value prop. Gaming is moving online. That's a big picture idea. Legacy operators, think about brick and mortar casino that has very loyal customer base in its locality, wants to enter online world. Yet, those brick and mortar players are not tech companies. It's tough for them. They don't have expertise. They don't have resources. GAN can do that for those customers. It can do a little bit of hand-holding and bring them online. Only a few largest iGaming players have scale that allows them to bring the tech in-house. For example, DraftKings has that tech stack, stack in-house completely. GAN is licensed in most jurisdictions in the United States where iGaming or online sports betting is allowed. And speak to market. If iGaming operator chooses a wrong PAM or try to do it him, itself and misses the launch of the entire state, well, good luck catching up with other competitors already captured the market share. And finally, there is an interesting patent that Gen owns, which links offline loyalty, loyalty reward system with the online world. In fact, there is an interesting litigation being pursued right now by Gen against one of the companies in the brick and mortar space. Uh, we don't know the outcome, but it's very interesting to watch. And by the way, this patent uh, litigation and potential patent monetization in the future I'm not even counting on that at all, but it can be a very nice uplift to the entire free cash flow slash revenue of the business in the future, if they win. So GAN is building a mode as we speak, in my opinion. It has high switching costs. There is anecdotal, I wouldn't call it data, but people's view that if you try, if an existing operator tries to switch from one PAM to another PAM, you can lose anywhere between 25 to up to 40 or even higher percent of your clients. So it's probably risky to do that, to, to, to say the least. Then GAN has track record. It's launched in many states in the US, launched a number of operators, and those operators are making money. The, GAN also knows the regulations and has very collaborative relationships with regulators. That's important. The reputation. Nobody gets fired for buying IBM. If several good players launched using GAN in Michigan or New Jersey or Pennsylvania or any other place, and it's working, you're probably not going to get fired if you go with GAN in a new state when and if such state legalizes. And then there also, as I mentioned, integration across several products. And by the way, the code should be spelled with two S. Now let's look at GAN revenue. The black color is B2B and green color is B2C. As you can see, 2018, 2019, that was a big jump in revenue. From 19 to 20, it was less expensive. Remember, from year to year, revenue can be jumpy because in addition to recurring revenue or usage-based revenue, there may be some additional one-off uh, sources of revenue, which is really implementation revenue. So it comes and goes. It's, it's still, again, I, I would think that GAN still makes money on that but it's not the area that is recurring. So it's less exciting. So you will see some variability from uh, year to year. And if you look at 2021, 2022, you also will see green boxes or green bars. This is B2C revenue. And you will see that it's a lot bigger than B2B. And that's what I think also creates some confusion among investors. This is getting gross profit margin. So from 2019 up to second quarter 2020, it expanded nicely. 
And as you can see, it's hanging around 70%. So it's pretty good gross profit margin. This is adjusted EBITDA. It's either annual or for 2022, it's LTM as of six, as of June 30th. And this is what is interesting. You see, it has been a little bit all over the place. You've seen some very negative years. You see some very positive years. And I will zoom in a little bit and I will show you here EBITDA margin quarterly. And you will see that at some point, GAN did 50% in fourth quarter 2019. And that's what got people really excited. And when later the EBITDA margin didn't show up, I guess many people were disappointed. This is GAN valuation at a glance. Again, you can pick any multiple, any metric here that you like. It can be gross profit, but that includes, remember, B2B and B2C, or you can look only at, uh, at, the, uh, at the recurring revenue, which is B2B recurring revenue, it's a third uh, metric from the top. That's roughly two and a half times. So again, I think for this type of business, it's way too cheap. And remember, I'm also ignoring any B2C here. Now, what are the risks? First, game and industry, gaming, I game structure. If you believe that top two, three players, whoever those will be, would eventually control 80% plus of the US market, then maybe in the tough spot. Because in order to be successful, in my opinion, GAN needs to have different players in the market. And some of them will be having tech in-house, for example, like DraftKings like Draft does, and some will be using either GAN or someone else. So that's one risk, something to watch out for. Then competition. Right now, competition is limited, but it's something to watch out for continuously. Now how I think it should play out. And again, I'm saying should in quotes because who knows? But this is my timeline, how I think about it. Then would continue to grow its B2B revenue. I think the margin should be expanding and GAN should get to FCF break even, probably in 2023. Continue expanding margins even after that due to very high incremental margins. I estimate incremental margins to be between 40 and 50%. As revenue grows and margins show up and expand and free cash flow hits, I think the multiple would increase accordingly. Nice bonus if in any new states in the US or maybe even countries may, uh, may legalize, that would be great for GAN. For example, when Ontario in Canada legalized several months ago, one of the big GAN clients launched there and GAN is supporting them. That was wonderful gift from our neighbors across the border. Finally, B2C. I haven't even spoken about B2C business, but it's still there. It's profitable. It does something good. And on top of that, remember I mentioned that patent litigation, that can be a very nice wild card in a positive way, in my opinion. So what's the upside? Look, I've shown you the multiple way trades today. I think the B2B revenue should be growing. I think multiples will be expanding. Hard to guess. I have my views, but you know, I'm not going to try to be, I, I'm not going to share with you what I think multiples should be at because it's always a little bit of a beauty competition. I think two and a half times recurring revenue is way too cheap. Should it be high? I think so. I think so. Can it be five? Probably. Can it be six? Maybe seven? It's also possible. And remember that the revenue stream that is, in my opinion, will be increasing. So that's the, my contact info. If you have questions about GAN, feel free to reach out.